Deep beneath Sydney, a $3.1 billion megaproject lies broken. The M6 motorway, a set of twin four-kilometer tunnels plunging up to 90 meters underground, is 90% complete. Yet it sits paralyzed, its concrete heart shattered. A drone footage reveals a scene of engineering catastrophe. A crumbling, waterlogged cavern where multi-million dollar machines lie buried under piles of rubble. A single 244-meter stretch of unstable ground has brought this colossal undertaking to its knees. How did a state-of-the-art tunnel, boring through Sydney's well-known geology, run into a geological monster that now threatens to bury this entire project forever? This tunnel was meant to be the final piece of a puzzle that Sydney has been trying to solve for over 70 years. The dream of a great southern motorway, a direct link for the city's sprawling southern suburbs, began back in 1951 when a corridor of land was set aside for the future F6 extension. For decades, it was just a line on a map, a promise of a faster future that never seemed to arrive. But in the mid-2000s, the plan was revived, and in December 2019, stage one of the newly named M6 motorway was given the green light. It was declared critical state significant infrastructure, a project so important it couldn't wait any longer. So, after decades of waiting, how were engineers finally going to carve this vital artery beneath one of the world's busiest cities? The answer wasn't one of the giant, city-block-long tunnel boring machines, or TBMs, that you might have seen on other Sydney mega-projects. For the M6, engineers chose a different kind of beast, the road header. Imagine a 100-ton mechanical monster on massive steel tracks, like a tank built for mining. At the front, it doesn't have a giant circular drill. Instead, it has a powerful, hydraulic arm. And at the end of that arm is a spinning cutter head, studded with dozens of incredibly hard tungsten carbide picks. It's not a drill, it's a grinder. A road header is what's known as a partial face excavator, meaning it doesn't bore a perfect circle. It carves and shapes the tunnel, giving engineers more flexibility to create different profiles like arches or wider caverns. The plan was to use up to 10 of these machines, working around the clock, deep underground. Their main target was Sydney's famous Hawkesbury Sandstone, a layer of rock known for being strong and stable, perfect for tunnelling. The process was methodical, a technique called heading and bench. First, a road header would advance, its spinning head grinding away at the top half of the tunnel, the heading, as it carved forward, the raw rock face would be immediately secured. Crews would drill long steel bolts, some up to 10 meters long, deep into the surrounding rock, and spray the walls and ceiling with a thick layer of concrete called shotcrete, creating an instant, super-strong shell. Once the top was secure, a road header would come back to excavate the bottom half, the bench, completing the tunnel profile. Each machine chewed through the rock at a steady pace of about 20 to 25 meters per week. But not all of the tunnel's path was through solid sandstone. Some sections were known to be softer sands and clays, requiring a different approach, using excavators and a technique called jet grouting, where a cement-like mixture is blasted into the soft ground to solidify it before digging. And it's here that a critical decision may have been made. According to reports, the lead contractor allegedly chose a cheaper tunnelling strategy, despite warnings from a key subcontractor about the risks involved in the difficult ground conditions. For months, the road headers ground their way forward, carving out kilometre after kilometre of tunnel. It seemed like the 70-year wait was finally coming to an end. But then, in March 2024, deep beneath the suburb of Rockdale, the ground fought back. Without warning, the earth gave way. A massive sinkhole, 10 meters wide, opened up in an industrial estate directly above the tunnel's path. The collapse was so violent, it tore the foundations from under a two-story office building, causing it to partially collapse. This wasn't happening in the deepest part of the tunnel. Here, the excavation was dangerously shallow, just 12 to 16 meters below the surface, barely the height of a four-story building separating the tunnelers from the world above. Days later, a second sinkhole appeared just 150 meters away. All work was immediately stopped. The project was in crisis. The contractor, a joint venture known as CGU, 
quickly pointed the finger at a shocking geological discovery. They claimed their machines had run into something that nobody could have predicted, a high angle reverse fault. So, what exactly is a reverse fault and why is it a tunneler's worst nightmare? To understand, picture the Earth's crust as giant blocks of rock. A fault is simply a crack where these blocks move against each other. In a normal fault, one block slides down against the other, but a reverse fault is far more violent. It's caused by immense compression, where the blocks are being squeezed together with unimaginable force. This pressure forces one block to grind its way up and over the other. This upward grinding motion shatters the rock along the fault line, creating a zone of broken, unstable rubble. Tunneling through it is like trying to dig a hole through a pile of broken glass while someone is actively stomping on it. The contractor's defense was simple. They claimed this specific type of fault had never been seen before in the Sydney Basin and was therefore an unforeseeable catastrophe. But this geological bombshell didn't just stop the machines, it triggered a billion dollar blame game. Who was responsible for this underground nightmare? The answer would be fought not by engineers but by lawyers. The core of the dispute comes down to the type of agreement signed for the M6. A design and construct contract. This is crucial. It means the contractor was paid not only to build the tunnel, but also to create the engineering designs for it. The government's position was clear. If your design didn't account for the geological risks, it's your responsibility to fix it. In response, the contractor, CGU, took a dramatic step. They declared the contract frustrated a legal term claiming that a completely unforeseen event had made it impossible to finish the job, and announced they were downing tools and walking away from the project. The Premier of New South Wales, Chris Minns, was furious. In a now famous statement, he told the media, My best advice to the contractor today is to send the lawyers home and bring back the engineers. The project was now in complete limbo. Tunneling in the damaged 244-metre section has been stopped for over a year, and the government has already spent more than $5.5 million on legal fees alone. With the project stalled, news outlets obtained shocking drone footage from inside the abandoned tunnel. The images showed a scene of utter devastation, concrete walls crumbling, water pouring in, and expensive machinery half buried in mud and rock. With the project in ruins and lawyers arguing over who should pay, a much bigger question loomed. Could this engineering disaster even be fixed? According to experts, the answer is yes, but it will require some of the most advanced and expensive techniques in the world of civil engineering. The first line of defense is a technique called grouting. This involves drilling a pattern of holes into the unstable, shattered rock of the fault zone and pumping in a specialized, cement-like mixture under high pressure. This grout spreads through all the cracks and voids, effectively gluing the broken rock back together into a solid, stable and waterproof mass. Engineers would essentially build an artificial block of stable rock underground before carefully excavating the tunnel through it. If the ground is too unstable or waterlogged even for grouting, they could turn to a more extreme solution, ground freezing. This incredible process involves drilling a series of pipes into the earth around the tunnel's path and circulating a supercooled liquid, like a salty brine, through them. The temperature drops so low that it freezes all the water in the surrounding soil and rock, turning the unstable, muddy ground into a solid frozen block as hard as concrete. Once the ground is frozen solid, it can be safely excavated. Finally, the design of the tunnel lining itself may need to change. A rigid concrete shell could crack if the fault moves even slightly in the future. To prevent this, engineers can install a flexible lining with special yielding elements. You can think of these like giant shock absorbers built directly into the tunnel walls. They are designed to compress and deform, allowing the tunnel to flex with any ground movement instead of shattering. These incredible solutions show that a fix is possible, but every single one of them comes with a staggering price tag in both time and money. That price tag is now the project's biggest unknown. The M6 budget has already exploded from its original $2.52 billion to an estimated $3.1 billion, and that was before the collapse. The government is no longer publishing a final cost estimate, leaving taxpayers in the dark. 
the timeline is just as grim. The original 2025 opening date is a distant memory. The official new date is late 2028, but government officials have privately admitted it could be many years longer, with potential delays pushing the opening into the 2030s. For now, the dream of a faster southern corridor is on hold. The promise of bypassing 23 sets of traffic lights, of taking 2,000 heavy trucks off local roads every day, and of saving commuters up to 15 minutes on their journey to the city, remains unfulfilled. While an agreement has been reached to finish the surface works, like new parks and a five-kilometer walking and cycling path, the main prize, the tunnel itself, remains a giant, waterlogged and incredibly expensive question mark buried deep beneath Sydney. The missing link is still very much missing. The battle for the M6 is far from over. Will the engineers win this underground war against one of geology's toughest challenges? Or is this project destined to become Sydney's most expensive mistake? Let us know what you think in the comments below. For more deep dives into the world's most incredible mega builds, make sure to like this video, subscribe to Ultimate Mega Builds, and hit that notification bell so you never miss our next episode.